Boy, these shows are so much fun for me to do because all I have to do is stumble upon an extremely inspirational, deep Catholic spiritual writer and become enamored of him and her. And then I get to share it over the air. And that's what's happened. I've recently become a great fan of a Catholic priest who uh, died about uh, 50 years ago now, 1970, who was, um, he, his cause is underway. He's a servant of God. Um, I think he is a saint without a question whether he gets canonized or not is up to the church. But um, I will be reading from some of his writings. His name is Father Dolindo. And um, Padre Pio, I think many of you, most of you, certainly the hardcore Catholics among you, know who St. Padre Pio is. And uh, he said several things about Father Dolindo. One was, no word can be lost from what came under Father Dolindo's pen, he's a holy priest. And on another occasion, St. Padre Pio said to a group of pilgrims from Naples, Padre Pio was in one town in Italy, Piet Pietrocina, and uh, Naples is, was another town in Italy, quite far away. And Padre Pio said to a group of pilgrims from Naples, why do you come here? If you have Father Dolindo in Naples, go to him. He's a saint. So anyway, um, this uh, priest and prophet and holy man, Father Dolindo, wrote many books. He helped many people. He gave everything he had to the poor. Um, he wrote a 10,000-page uh, exegesis of the Holy Scriptures. Um, and uh, he's very well known also for a novena that he wrote. He actually wrote it in the form of a prayer, if I understand correctly and it's been turned into Novena and is known as the Surrender Novena. And I will be reading that because I can't resist in, in a few moments. Um, but um, anyway, and he had a very penitential life. He suffered a great deal. Um, he was uh, the victim of some calumny, of some false gossip about him that resulted in him being um, unable to function as a priest for almost half of his priestly life. But he took it all, um, needless to say, with a spirit of great mortification and love of the church. Um, and now, um, and frankly, many, many pilgrims seek out his tomb, which is in Naples, uh, and pray for his intercession. His full name, by the way, was Father Dolindo Rotolo. So that's all I'm going to do in the way of a biography. Um, Dolindo, by the way, is spelled D-O-L-I-N-D-O, -O, if any of you wish to look him up or Google him or something. So I'm going to start the show with uh, the prayer of his, which is usually recited as a novena, but I'm going to read it as uh, the prayer. Um, when it's used as a novena, each paragraph, uh, it's... There are nine paragraphs, and one paragraph is said every day of, for nine days running, the structure of a novena. And after each paragraph is repeated, um, uh, is repeated uh, ten times, Oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you, take care of everything. That's the theme of the, um, of the uh, um, prayer. So, here goes, a prayer of the servant of God, Father Dolindo Rotolo. Jesus speaking to the soul. Why are you upset and agitated? Leave you, your cares to me and all will be fine. I tell you honestly, every act of true and blind reliance on me results in what you desire and will resolve all your difficulties. Abandonment to me does not mean being frustrated, becoming anxious and desperate, offering me your anxious prayer so that I may follow you 
and have your anxiety be a prayer. Abandonment, rather, means to shut the eyes of your soul in peace, moving your thoughts away from your troubles. And instead of thinking about your worries and pain, let me take over your troubles. Simply say, Jesus, you take over. To be worried, restless, and to think of the consequences of an event is the opposite of reliance. It is really contrary to it. It is like a child who wants his mom to take care of his needs, but in the way he wants, and with his whims and childish ideas, he actually hampers her work. So shut your eyes and go with the flow of my grace. Do not ponder over your present moment and put away thoughts of your future as a temptation. Rest in me, believe in my goodness, and I swear on my love that I will take care of it. That if you think like this, Jesus, you take over, I indeed will do it for you. I will comfort you, free you, and guide you. If I have to take you in a different direction from the one you are looking at, I will train you, I will pick you up in my arms, and you will find yourself like a baby sleeping in its mother's arms on the other shore. What gives you immense stress and hurts you is your reasoning over it, your thoughts and the pains it gives you. It is wanting at all costs to take care by yourself of what is afflicting you. How many things I can do be it a material or spiritual need, when the soul turns to me, looks at me, and says to me, Jesus, you take over, and closes its eyes and rests in me. You do not receive many graces because you insist on getting them by yourself, but instead you will receive numberless graces when your prayer is in full reliance on me. When you are in pain and you pray that I may act, You want me to act as you believe I should. You do not turn to me. Instead, you want me to submit to your ideas. You are like a sick person who does not ask the doctor for the cure, but tells him what the cure should be. Don't be like this, but pray as I taught you in the hour, Father. Hallowed be your name, which means may you be glorified in this need of mine. Your kingdom come, which means... Everything may work toward your kingdom in us and in the world. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means you direct it as it seems best to you for the good of your of our eternal and temporal life. When you truly tell me your will be done, which is the same then as to say, Jesus, you take over, then I do intervene with all my omnipotence. And I will resolve every situation, even if there seems to be no way out. For example, do you see your sickness becoming worse instead of improving? Don't become anxious. Close your eyes and tell me with trust. Your will be done, Jesus. You take over. I repeat, I do take care. I I intervene like a doctor and even do a miracle if it is necessary. Does a patient become worse? Don't be frightened. Close your eyes and say, Jesus, you take over. I tell you again, I will indeed do it for you, and there is no medicine more powerful than my loving intervention. I take over only when you close your eyes. You never sleep. You want to appraise everything, to think, to delve into everything. You choose to rely on human power, or worse, on men, trusting in their intervention. This is what hampers my words and my will. Oh, how much I long for this reliance in order to assist you, and how much I grieve to see your anxiety. Satan does just this. He gives you the anxiety to remove me from you and to throw you into the human initiative. Trust only in me instead. Rest in me. Rely on me in everything. I have been resisting um, stopping in order to interject um, anything myself because this prayer is so unspeakably beautiful. But I do want to repeat that last sentence and I do want to underline it, so to speak. Because Jesus is talking about our anxiety at our problems. And what does Jesus say here? He says, Satan does exactly this. He gives you the anxiety 
in order to remove me from you and throw you into the human initiative. So what Jesus is saying here is that the anxiety we feel is exactly from Satan and is a tactic of him, of his. Because when we feel that anxiety, then we don't trust entirely in Jesus. We actually separate ourselves from Jesus and we start trusting in our own initiative or even worse, in the initiative of other men. So anxiety is itself the enemy. Anxiety is when we become anxious, we are succumbing to a, a temptation from Satan and making it a successful temptation. We are falling into temptation by becoming anxious. The anxiety itself is Satan's primary tool to separate ourselves from Jesus, to get Jesus out of the equation. Do you see? So the key, the key is anxiety. The key is to recognize anxiety immediately as coming from Satan and something to be rejected, not something to be incorporated into the way we address a situation. Um, if we got a temptation from Satan, let's say of lust or something, and uh, I'm obviously a man, so I'll cast it in the in the um, you know role of uh, the temptation occurring to a man. But if a man should see a beautiful woman walking down the street, and should have the thought, oh. Maybe I should divorce my wife and try to court her instead. It wouldn't take him long to recognize that thought as coming from Satan, right? And being a temptation from the devil that he should reject. You know, if you're in a store and you think no one's looking and you see something that you want, you know, unguarded on a counter and you have the thought, oh, I could just reach out my hand and slip that in my pocket and walk out and no one would be the wiser. You recognize it pretty quickly, right? That that's a uh, temptation of Satan and it's something that you should reject. But when you get anxious, do you do the same thing? Do you say, oh, that's a temptation of Satan that I should reject? Or do you say, well, of course I have to be anxious. I'm sick and I might die. Do you see what I mean? So you should put it in the same category as the other temptations from Satan. This one's just a little bit subtler and better disguised, but it does just as good a job as separating yourself from uh, separating you from Jesus, right? I mean, if you steal something, you're separated from Jesus because you've committed a sin. If you lust in your heart, you're separated from Jesus because you've committed a sin. And if you're anxious, you're separated from Jesus, perhaps in another way, perhaps it's not a sin in the same way, but you have taken Jesus out of the equation. You have handcuffed him and you have prevented him from intervening to your benefit. You've prevented him from taking care of this situation. Anyway, I, I had to do that, right? Because this is absolutely at the heart of everything. Okay, Satan does exactly this. He gives you the anxiety to remove me from you and to throw you into the human initiative. Trust only in me instead. Rest in me. Rely on me in everything. I do miracles in proportion to your complete reliance on me, with no thought of yourself. I spread treasures of graces when you are in the most squalid poverty. If you have your own resources, even a few, or if you seek them, you are at the natural level. Thus you follow the natural way of things which are often dominated by Satan. Never has a thinker or a philosopher ever done any miracle, not even among the saints. Only he who relies on God does divine work. When you see that things become complicated, say with your eyes closed, Jesus, I abandon myself to you. Jesus, you take over and stop worrying about it because your mind is sharp and for you it is difficult to distinguish evil but trust in me and let your mind wander away from your thoughts do this for all your needs all of you do this and you shall see great things endless and silent miracles i swear it on my love i shall indeed take over and you can be sure of it pray always with this loving confidence and you shall have great peace and great fruits, even when I choose for you the grace of immolating yourself for reparation and a love that entails suffering. Do you believe it is impossible? Shut your eyes and say with all your souls, Jesus, you take over. Don't be afraid. 
I will indeed take care of you, and you shall bless my name in humility. A thousand prayers do not equal only one act of abandonment. Don't ever forget it. There is no better novena than this. O Jesus, I abandon myself to you. Jesus, you take over. And so ends the prayer. And um, I think mo more of us are familiar with it in, this, in the form of the surrender novena, which I cannot recommend too highly. My, my wife, I must give her a lot to surrender over to Jesus because there are days when she says it nonstop, just over and over again, the novena. And uh, so anyway, that you can find also quite easily on the internet. And it's even uh, printed on prayer cards nowadays and so forth. Father Dolindo's Surrender Novena. I've never seen it before uh, today, actually, in the form of the original prayer. But I think the original prayer that I just read is, is very beautiful also. And it goes into a little bit more detail. The Novena has been sliced up to make to make uh, nice little nuggets of, you know, one day's um, meditation and then the uh, ten times repeating, Oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you, take care of everything. And before I go on to other things of Father Dolindo, I will say, first of all, I've been remiss. Um, I, like, I like speaking to you so much that sometimes I forget to say this isn't just meant for me to be speaking to you, but it's meant for you to be speaking to me too. This is a call-in show. I, I can't believe I'm one-third of the way through the show and I forgot to remind you this is a call-in show. The number here is 866-333-6279, which is the same as 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y, for obvious reasons. And if you're out of the country, uh, uh, or if you just prefer using Skype, you can Skype us here at Radio Maria USA Studio. And if a call comes in, um, I, I try to keep my eyes consistently on the, uh, on the um, call board. And so if a call comes in, I will try to uh, get to the end of the current sentence I'm saying and turn to the call. And about at the midway point of the show, which is coming up in about 10 minutes, I usually take a short musical break to allow um, to allow uh, an opportunity to call without appearing to interrupt anything. Because then after the break, I just turn to the call board right away. And before I get rolling again, uh, take your calls. So again, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. And with that, I'm going to go back to Father Dolindo. Let me just say that the uh, surrender prayer that I just read should be reminding us, I think, of the uh, of Saint Faustina, the Apostle of Divine Mercy. And remember the image that Jesus had Saint Faustina reproduce: said, "Jesus, I trust in you." At the bottom, and Jesus says over and over again to Saint Faustina in the locutions which are recorded in her diary, which I strongly recommend, the diary of St. Faustina, Jesus says over and over again that he will perform miracles in proportion to how much trust we have in him. And the only thing that limits his intervention and limits uh, the miracles he will perform for us is, is the limit that we have on our confidence in him and in our trust in him. And I will also say, by the way, that Father Dolindo, unlike yours truly, not only talks the talk, but he walked the walk, because he had a tremendous amount of horrible suffering in his life, both physical and spiritual. Imagine being a totally dedicated and impassioned priest and being forbidden from exercising your priesthood for, uh, I don't remember, it was somewhere between 17 and 28 years. I don't remember the exact number of years, um, and and what a what a persecution that is, and yet he never had a murmur of complaint about it, or of uh, disrespect for the authorities that treated him so unjustly and so forth. So he definitely um, 
walked the walk, as well as doing a beautiful job of talking the talk. Although, if one takes him at face value, that uh, prayer I read did not come from him, but it was essentially the words of Jesus. So, okay. Take a deep breath. And okay, now I'm going to turn the page, so to speak. Uh, the book is still Father Dolindo. Um, but, um, uh, in other words, I'm, I'm still reading from Father Dolindo, but I'm moving on from the surrender prayer to a book he wrote called Come Holy Spirit, which is a relatively short book. It's about 150 pages, but it's all about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And um, that's something that I think we as Catholics have heard a lot over the course of our lives. But um, it's one thing to hear it, and it's quite another thing to actually understand what's going on with the fruits of the Holy Spirit and so forth, what they are and what it means and so forth. So um, I will read a couple of short uh, passages from from Come Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, I think what I'll do is read, this is not short passages actually, he has a section in this book which are detailed explanations of each fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now very often we hear this list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit in this, uh, in this uh, account of it, those fruits are charity, joy, peace, patience, uh, kindness, um, modesty, oh, excuse me, long-suffering, gentleness, modesty, and um, chastity, and continence. Those are the 12, 12 fruits that he lists here. I will repeat them. Um, charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness, gentleness sometimes being called meekness, modesty, continence, and chastity. Now, if you're like me, that sounds kind of overlapping, kind of repetitive. What's the difference between, for instance, um, you know, charity and kindness and goodness, right? Um, just as an example. And he does a very good job, actually, here of explaining exactly what each one means, and tying it into the life of Jesus and the example that Jesus gave us. As a matter of fact, I should say, if I, I, I'm going backwards and forwards here, um, but um, it's very important to realize, uh, I'll, I'll start with his introduction, and, and by the time I finish his introduction, it'll probably be time to take the break and invite callers. But anyway, um, Here's, here is the introduction to the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which basically says that we're not going to reach heaven if we do not, um, if we do not have the fruits of the Holy Spirit grow in us. I know that's pretty scary, but there you have it. So I'll just read from him. Our soul cannot save itself and reach eternal glory if it does not produce supernatural fruits of virtue. John the Baptist said, Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Matthew 3. We are like plants in the vineyard of the Lord, and we must bear fruit for him. But we cannot do this except with the grace of the Holy Spirit. From his gifts and by means of his gifts, fruits mature in us. With the power of germination which he confers on us supernaturally, and with ingrafting into Jesus Christ our soul, like a luxuriant plant, bears fruit. The fruit may be wild or domesticated. Wild fruit is the natural fruit of the plant. The domesticated fruit is that which is formed via the engrafting of the plant. If we work like men only in human fashion, well, no, I should let me back up a bit. The graft affects a life within a life, and it gives the plant a strength capable of drawing from the sun more select dispositions and of producing better fruit. We too 
engrafted into Jesus Christ by baptism and vivified by the Holy Spirit, who, as it were, is the sun which makes us fecund and the water which nourishes us and makes us grow, must bear supernatural fruits. Okay, so so what Father Delindo is doing here is drawing a sharp distinction between anything we can accomplish on our own and anything that and everything that we can only accomplish because we are grafted into Jesus Christ. We are grafted into Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can bear fruit that is essentially coming from him and is not within our nature and is not something that we could bear if we weren't grafted into him. The pagans have virtues also, <clears throat> excuse me, but they had natural virtues. And what Father Delindo is saying is that natural virtues aren't sufficient to reach eternal salvation. We must have these supernatural virtues, these supernatural fruits of the Holy Spirit that we are able to nurture in us only because we're grafted into Jesus Christ in order to make it into heaven. They are a requirement, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They are not optional, and they are not the same thing as natural virtues. Okay, I will uh, go back to um, uh, Father Delindo. If we work like men only in human fashion on the basis of right reason, our actions, even though good from a human point of view, may be compared to wild fruits which in no way are useful for eternal life because they have nothing of the divine nature. You see, the, fruit of the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit have a divine nature. These actions may be a remote disposition for grace, but the fruits of such actions cannot be genuine means of grace capable of lifting us up to union with God. If instead we work on the basis of sanctifying grace, that is to say, through the merits of Jesus Christ, once we have been engrafted into him by the Holy Spirit, with the consequent engrafting of the virtues and gifts into us, then our fruits become fruits of divine beauty and goodness, i.e., supernatural fruits of eternal life. These are rightly called fruits of the Holy Spirit because they proceed more from him than from us and therefore are more his than ours. Hence, we should ascribe the possession to him and the enjoyment of them to us. That's been, that's been a short introduction. I'm obviously not going to get through all of the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit and what they mean. Okay, so um, continuing with this overview, so to speak, of the importance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit actually for salvation and the difference between them and the growth of natural virtue, let's say, that comes from human nature rather than coming from our gra being grafted into Christ. Um, I will continue with Father Delindo. It is not a matter of indifference for us, nor a simple act of super, super erogation to produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. For if we do not produce those fruits, we shall produce those of the flesh. If we do not produce fruits of eternal life, we shall produce the fruits of eternal death. There is no in-between state. Indeed, Jesus Christ compares us to branches on a vine, and he demands that they bear fruit. Jesus says, quote, this is from John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me which does not bear fruit, he will take away. And every branch which bears fruit, he will cleanse, so that it bears more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remain on the vine, so neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me, because without me you can do nothing. Uh, now continuing with this issue of the uh, fruits of the flesh, we will turn to St. Paul in uh, Galatians. Uh, this is from Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are immorality, uncleanness, 
licentiousness, idolatry, witchcraft, enmities, contention, jealousies, anger, quarrels, factions, parties, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and such like. But the fruits of the Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, modesty, continence, cha uh, chastity. Those are the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit, which we began with a few minutes ago. I will repeat those two sets, okay? Fruits of the flesh and fruits of the Spirit. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are immorality, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, witchcraft, enmities, contentions, jealousies, anger, quarrels, factions, parties, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousings, and such like. But the fruits of the Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, modesty, continence, and chastity. A first glance at the ensemble of these twelve fruits shows that the first three, charity, joy, peace, regard the soul's relations with God himself. Charity is the love which unites us to God. Joy is the gratitude and thanks for the infinite divine goodness in which we live and move. Peace is tranquil rest in God, secure in the order of his law, and hence it is tranquility in our inmost self and with our neighbor. Next follow the fruits, which individually and specifically regard one's neighbor, the first being patience. Do we bear with our neighbor, or are we irritable, vindictive, resentful, and malicious? If it is the latter, we are far from the kindness of God. From a good heart, as from a pure fountain, comes forth goodness. But goodness, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is not a simple, naturally good heart, in virtue of the sensibility of the person. It is the supernaturally good heart, which comes from the love of God above all things and in all creatures. Long-suffering is the perennial radiation of a loving heart that treats everyone lovingly and judges their defects with kindness. It is a more generous charity towards one's neighbor, more constant and more persevering in doing good. Gentleness is affectionate, kind, tolerant, dismisses injuries and resentment, sincere in loving kindness without harboring in one's heart grudges against them. Faith, better perhaps expressed as fidelity, because it's not a reference to, this, to, to the theological virtue of faith, it's more faithfulness, is the observance and maintenance of a pledged word, not for motives of human respect, but for love of God, because one considers his pledged word as an oath. Finally, there are those fruits which refer to ourselves, modesty in one's comportment, conduct, attire, continence by means of which we repress disorderly passions, and lastly, chastity, the transparent purity of soul, the custody of the senses, and the renunciation of all that might give occasion for staining the soul. So that was a very short little summary of the Twelve Fruits of the Holy Spirit. But then Father Delindo goes into a detailed explanation of each of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So with the time that we have remaining, I will begin on those. I will not get too far. With any luck, I might get through the, um, the ones that relate to our relationship to God, the first three, um, charity, joy, and peace. Um, and again, uh, I'm happy to take any calls. If anyone wishes to call in, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. But continuing, charity, which is actually uh, is a good place for us to continue to because it's probably in many ways the least obvious of what these... Uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit mean. 
Charity is the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is the foundation and the root of all the others. Being himself infinite charity and infinite love, it is logical that he should communicate to the soul his flame, making the soul love God with its whole heart, with all its strength and with all its mind, and its neighbor for love of God. Remember Jesus said that the two most important commandments are love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. We're not going to do that out of our own human natures. We can do that um, through our ingrafting with Christ. Continuing with uh, Father Delindo. Where this love is wanting, there can be found no supernatural act, no merit of eternal life, no true and complete happiness. It is logical also that charity be a most sweet fruit, because the love of God is the attainment of one's proper end on earth, and is the principle of its attainment in eternity. Hence, it is the full satisfaction of one's entire being. In speaking specifically of charity, then, it is clear that one does not intend to speak of the virtue of kindness, although this is included in charity as a particular manifestation and outpouring of love towards one's neighbor. Charity, as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is principally the flame of the love for God, the esteem for him above all things, tender respect for his majesty, adoration of him in the Trinity, affectionate care in honoring him and making him honored, generous detachment from everything else to find him the treasure of the soul, the power of love, which makes one conquer every obstacle that blocks the exercise of the virtues, which makes one take up and carry one's cross as a treasure, and which makes, however, much one does for God always seem very little. From this flame of charity is born that of the love of neighbor. But this love is not natural tenderness and compassion towards one's suffering. It is not generosity in giving to one who is in need, but is the love of God in his image, a love a thousand times more beneficial to one's neighbor who suffers because it is not motivated by sympathy for others or by personal need to be generous, but is given out of esteem for God. Hence, it is steady, impartial, and heroic in its every manifestation and possesses the highest value, even in its least outpouring, because charity is the admirable alchemy which can change rocks into precious gold. So I'm just going to underline a couple of uh, points that he's made here. And um, one of them, which is very important, is that this uh, fruit of the Holy Spirit of charity is not a natural love of neighbor, so to speak, natural compassion towards someone who is suffering, but it is a love of God in his image. It is lo the love of neighbor that flows from this charity is a manifestation of the love of God directed towards God in that other person. Every human soul is made in the image and likeness of God, and every human soul is intended by God to reach heaven. And the love we have for God should be transmuted, should, should be transformed into a universal love of God in our fellow man. Continuing. Joy. That's a fruit of the Holy Spirit that we all we all wish we had, right? Um, actually, all of these, of course, we should wish we had, probably equally. Joy is a fruit which spontaneously arises from charity, as fragrance does from a flower, light from the sun, heat from fire. Every good work done with ease gives the soul a profound joy in effect of the satisfaction which one has in the victory won over self and in having produced good. In charity, then, joy surpasses all measure, 
because to our love corresponds the love of God. The soul not only enjoys a calm, holy conscience free of all anxiety, but it is filled with joy from the love of God, which overflows in the soul in response to that soul's love. The joy which comes from the Holy Spirit does not grow dim even in tribulations. During those times this joy can increase when tribulations are testimony to the love of God. As St. Paul could exclaim in 2 Corinthians, I overflow with joy in all our troubles. I'll go back to that. Maybe I'll go back to that now. Uh, you don't get very far reading in Father Dolindo without seeing reflections of the crosses in our lives. Actually, our lives are, are made up out of a chain of crosses, if, if you guys haven't noticed yet. And those crosses are not a bug. You know, we used to have an expression, I used to be a computer program, one man's bug is another man's feature. Those crosses are not a bug in the way God has arranged our lives. Those crosses are a feature in the way God has arranged our lives. Those crosses are the point of our lives. They're not stumbling blocks that again in the way of the point of our lives and he is continually coming back to the fact that our relationship to our crosses is actually at the center of our relationship to God and at uh, the center of our growth in virtue um, uh, so here uh, earlier in charity he said that um, the charity as the fruit of the Holy Spirit um, is the power of love which makes one conquer every obstacle blocking the exercise of the virtues which makes one take up and carry one's cross as a treasure and now here he says that our crosses can actually increase our joy as he says the joy which comes from the Holy Spirit does not grow dim even in tribulations. During those times, this joy can increase when tribulations are testimony to the love of God. As St. Paul could exclaim, I overflow with joy in all our troubles. If we embrace our crosses, and if we embrace our crosses as opportunities to demonstrate our love of God to God, and to demonstrate our uh, gratitude to God, in fact, then we can turn our crosses into opportunities for joy that are actually um, coexist with the suffering. Okay, continuing with Father Dolindo. The joy of the Holy Spirit is very different from what the world claims to offer in its diversions. Impure, excuse me, impure sensual, sensual delights, as St. John Chrysostom, is similar to the sensual, sensual pleasure which somebody with, excuse me, um, this is a quote, so I, I have to say it, the sensual pleasure which someone with scabs feel when they scratch themselves, because after the brief pleasure there follows a much longer pain and a still more bothersome annoyance. So St. John Chrysostom is saying that um, sensual pleasure is like the pleasure we have, uh, for instance, when you get a mosquito bite and it itches and you scratch it, you get a momentary pleasure at scratching the itch, but then the itch returns worse than ever and you're in a worse state than you were before you began. The sensuous pleasure of the world is slavery. The joy of the Holy Spirit is freedom of the Spirit and freedom from matter. The soul breathes in the atmosphere of the divine and experiences the joy of one who emerges from a cellar into the sunlight or escapes from the tumultuous waves to the security of solid ground. So joy, true joy, joy that flows from God, from love of God, is not only not at all the same thing as sensual pleasure, but in many ways it's the opposite of sensual pleasure. Uh, by the way, uh, Saint, well, no, I, I don't have time to go into Saint Ignatius of Loyola's observations of that. Uh, I just have a minute or two to try to at least mention peace. True joy, without the turmoil, this is, this is now the section on peace as a fruit of the Holy Spirit, True joy without the turmoil that divided love engenders brings with it the peace 
which is its perfection, because it supports and guarantees the tranquil enjoyment of the object loved. For the soul, the loved object par excellence can only be God, and hence peace is the tranquil security of possessing God and being in his grace. This is the peace of the Lord which, quote, surpasses all understanding, as St. Paul says, because it is a profound joy surpassing every joy based on the flesh or on material things, and to attain this we must immolate everything to God. So that's it. I've run out of time, so I can't, I've only gotten to three of the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit, and uh, who knows, maybe next week I'll continue. Uh, I never know beforehand what I'm going to do on the show. And by the way, I want to close. We're coming up on Thanksgiving, wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. And remember, Thanksgiving is about gratitude to God. Everything we have comes from God. So whether it's living in a free country, as we used to do, <laughs> we owe God gratitude for it. To the extent that we're still living in a free country, we owe God gratitude to it for it. For everything we possess, we owe God gratitude. And what do we owe God the most gratitude for? Our eternal destiny of an eternity of bliss with him, an eternity of bliss with him forever and ever and ever in his love and in his peace and in his joy and actually in the unmitigated ecstasy of heaven. So that's something also to not forget to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. So with that, it's time for me to say goodbye. You've been listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Showman. And I hope you join me again next week, same time, same place. And we will go out again with um, something else we have to be very grateful to God for, which is the gift of our blessed mother, our blessed mother. Our, our joy, our peace, and our hope that we get from our Blessed Mother. So back to Harpa Dei and their praises of the uh, Virgin Mary. And again, please join us again next week on Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism. This is Roy Shoman saying bye for now. <laughs> Tota pulcra es mai